the name of this next discussion is The Growth Potential of Emerging Markets and the Impact on the Global Economy. Um, our speakers will be making their way to the stage very shortly, and the moderator for that particular discussion is going to be Chris Giles, the economics editor of the Financial Times, and I see him coming to the stage right now. He is going to introduce the people that will be joining him um, on the panel for this discussion. Um, I think you would agree it's been a pretty dynamic morning, as will the rest of today and tomorrow. Um, and thank you, everyone, for remaining seated. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris as he is ready to introduce his panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, if I can invite uh, the panel onto the stage, I'd like to invite His Excellency Ali Sharif Al Ahmadi, the Minister of Finance of our host here, Qatar. His Excellency Berat Al Barat, the Minister of Treasury and Finance of Turkey. And Christian Seving, the Chief Executive of Deutsche Bank. Right, in this uh, last session uh, before lunch, uh, we are moving on to the economic sphere, the growth potential of emer emerging markets and the impact on the global economy. Now, my name's Chris Giles. I'm the economics editor of the Financial Times. I'm based in London, and it's, the irony is not lost on me that when uh, we often think of emerging markets being unstable and risky places in the world, and yet the place I've come from and the country I live in is fast showing all the classic signs of instability, definitely on the political front at the moment. But that's enough about uh, London. Uh, we're here to talk about the emerging markets, uh, and it's the growth potential in emerging world which is truly phenomenal. Just a few facts, just to kick us off. In the 1980s, two-thirds of all the growth in the world came from a very small number of advanced economies, essentially the G7, as they were then. Now, in this decade, 70% of the global growth will come from emerging markets. It's had remarkable effects on humanity across the world, extraordinary progress in eliminating poverty. So the proportion of people living below the UN definition of poverty of $1.90 per day is down from 40% of the world's population in 1980 to 10% in 2015. Now, that's clearly not enough. There's an ambition to eliminate poverty, extreme poverty altogether, but there has been a lot of progress made. And that has all, almost all come from rapid growth in emerging markets. But of course, not everything is rosy in the emerging world. 2018 this year has been a very difficult year. Lots of dollar outflows from across emerging markets. Some countries, in particular Turkey and Argentina, have had extremely challenging times. And global debt is at a record level, $182 trillion, according to the International Monetary Fund. So there is both a huge opportunity and quite a lot of risks and domestic fears. So this is the backdrop to our discussion this morning, both the opportunities and the fears. Now, maybe I would like to start with Your Excellency, Mr. Emadi. Um, Qatar is both sometimes classed as an emerging economy, even though it is the, has the highest GDP per capita in the world, but also as an investor in them. Can, I, can you give me your perspective on how you see the emerging world at the moment? Well, good, mo good morning, everybody, and uh, I'd like also to welcome our guest today here, and thank you for taking part of this uh, session, and welcome everybody to Doha Forum 2018. You know, talking about emerging market, yes, Qatar, Qatar is, is part of the emerging market, and, and it has, you know, probably a little bit of a different story than most of the countries around us, because of what happened in, in the last, you know, 20 years, and, and the phenomenal growth that, that, that we had. Uh, you know, if you look at where, where is the emerging market in, in 1990s, I think if I get the figure right, they, they were about, they were sharing about 30, 35%, 36% of, of the global GDP. 
this number today is about 55 to 56%. And I think where most of the projection is, I think in the next five years, this number will go probably to close to a 60% plus. Uh, so and I think if we're going to see that the impact of emerging market and global is very significant. Uh, we, we've seen, in, in especially in the 2018, some challenges on, 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 the, on, on the emerging markets. And, and you put an example of Turkey, Argentina. But especially in Turkey, I think that Minister of Finance is here, or he will talk about it. And also in Qatar, you know, I, I, I probably 2018 is an exception, but I think if you go back to 2017, especially when we started the blockade, you know, we've seen some outflows of Qatar, but I think 2018, we had a very good year in terms of growth, most of the growth coming from the private sectors. Despite the volatilities in oil, we, we've, uh, the private sector has really achieved close to 6% uh, growth in 2018. Uh, so it's, it's been, you know, our, our, as Qatar, usually people, the way we look at the emerging market is we have three different main elements. One of them is definitely energy. So energy plays usually a very important part on Qatar supplying energies to emerging market and fueling their economies and having uh, you know, a sustainable economy. So more than 40% of Qatar uh, energy export went to, to emerging market. Uh, I think the, the other part for us is, is connectivity. Uh, I think part of what happened in the emerging market was is, is really how the global and how the world changed in terms of connectivities. And, and for us, we are not a highly advanced technological countries, but we have what we call is our Qatar Airways connectivities with the global uh, world. And uh, we're connecting to more than 100 cities in the emerging market. And, and I think this by itself also put a lot of uh, positive toward, toward the global market. I think the other pillar for us is, is the financing part of it. Uh, you know, Qatar has enjoyed a long term of surpluses for the last 15 years. Okay, the last three years we had some deficit, but I think from 2000, uh, from 1999 until close to 2014, we had surpluses. Lots of these surpluses has been deployed to developing countries and also to, to emerging market. Now, Mr. Seving, uh, just as a, from the private sector, can I get your sense of how, how important are emerging markets to your business and how do you see the landscape at the moment? It should never be uh, underestimated how important I think the growth in the emerging markets has been on the overall industries. And I mean, just forget about the banks for, 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 for the time being. But if you look at my home country, at, the, um, at Germany, um, the growth and the demand of emerging markets around the world, and not only China, but uh, really around the world, has driven Germany's development um, to an enormous effect. And therefore, I think all the discussions we have about volatility and also the risk with emerging markets, if you look through the cycle, it is only positive for the global economy. And I think uh, we all benefit from it. But you obviously, as a risk manager, you also have to manage it with the right level of diversification. You have to advise your clients um, that obviously you have, um, when, you, when you act and deal with emerging markets, um, that you have a diversified landscape in terms of regions, in terms of countries, in terms of currencies. But overall, I mean, we, we just heard the numbers. Um, I think the growth of the world has been in particular driven by the emerging markets. That's what we need to support. And by the way, that's what we support as a private sector. Deutsche Bank's revenues, more than 20%, are coming from the emerging markets. We believe in that uh, growth scenario, but always with the right risk appetite. But if I compare that uh, with the previous years and, and how we have developed, then I think this will be a significant growth engine also in the future. Um, we very much look then also at political stability. It's not only at the underlying growth factor, but also how is the governance, how is the political stability. And if, if this all fits together, then honestly, I'm uh, actually very bullish, always under the condition 
you have to look through the cycle. Don't just value one year. What, for instance, which we have, what we have seen this year also in Turkey or in Argentina, yes, you have to observe that, but look through the cycle and then there is enormous growth potential where actually the developed market can benefit from. Thank you. Now, I wanted to also mention just to the room that at the end of this session, for at least 10 minutes or so, we'll be taking questions. So if you have questions, store them up, keep them brief, and I'll come to you with about 10 minutes to go. Now, I can't uh, have a panel here where we have a representative from Turkey in a year where Turkey has been at the eye of the storm in emerging markets without asking some questions. Uh, Mr. Albarat, Turkey's had an incredible challenges over recent years. A failed coup left people dead, 250 people killed, dozens of terrorist attacks, a major war on your border, three and a half million refugees. You've had a lot uh, to deal with it. And then, and you did it with great resilience. And then this year, essentially you had what was seen, has been seen around the world as something of a classic emerging markets crisis, a sudden stop of money, money flowing out, uh, plunge in the lira, interest rates up to 24%, inflation up to 25, but now coming down. Um, perhaps you could give us an account of how you are managing this situation and how you see it playing out. Thank you, Chris. First of all, I would like to thank my dear friend Ali and Qatari government about this beautiful organization in a beautiful uh, summer day in Doha, which we say we used to live in the winter, you know, in Europe. <laughs> it's always good to be here in winter time in Europe. And thank you for the warm hospitality. Uh, what you mentioned, Chris, is very much important, not only for Turkey, but also emerging markets, maybe more than that. What we are witnessing right now about this global challenges because of this global economical shift from west to east. This is why everybody is talking about this, uh, this wealth shift, power shift, economical shift from developed countries to emerging countries, developing countries, and what's happening in China and India, all these emerging market conditions. But about the Turkey story that you have mentioned, it's a very interesting one. It's a very strong journey, what we have witnessed so far in the last 16 years about Turkey's transformation, economically, politically, democratically, more than that. This is why we not only expand the economy or uh, the whole aspects of the economy quadrupled in the last 15, 16 years to GDP side, infrastructure side, and economical development on the base of the diversification and industrial side as well. And maybe much more important than that, Turkey transformed its generations, population in that sense as well. Turkey not only have a dynamic young population, which has averaged 29, 30%, 30 years old. Uh, that's the first time ever Turkish government, after 2002, 16 consecutive years, we have invested the highest portion of the cake, budget cake, to education. And this is why we ended up a very young, dynamic, confident, and a very much uh, volunteered, strong, managed, skilled workforce in that sense. 81 million population is significant if you're talking about in this region. And which means that two thirds of the global oil and reserves is in that region and within that capacity, what you need to do to increase the capability of doing business is crucial as well. You touch a little, a little bit about of them, the coup, the crisis, the tax, whatever. And I said this example, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger strategy is a good example for Turkey as well. Turkey learned a lot in 2001 crisis, eight crisis, moreover than that the whole whatever happened. But what about the last one and how Turkey survived after August fluctuations and the, all these vulnerabilities in the last couple of months is not only for the experience that Turkey has to lie so far, previous crisis, but moreover than that, Turkey made a very big thing after switching to a new presidential system. That's one of the crucial things. Because July 15, 2016, worst day ever in Turkish history. And I used to be living in New York, and I told the same story to my New Yorker friends. When I was there in September 11, it was the worst day ever in American history. 
not only New Yorkers, but the whole U.S. nation has been affected. But maybe that's worse than that, because not only to Turkish Republican history, that's the worst they ever, including Ottoman times for centuries, because not only hundreds of people died, thousands of them wounded, but that night, millions of them were on the street to save their future and democracy. And we ended up for two years to do what? The economy, not only all the time, was the number one priority of our agenda, became number three or four. What becomes the number one priority? Security. This is why Turkey started to fight with PKK, PYD, YPG, Daesh, FETÖ, whatever, all these internal threats, but the regional threats and organizations as well, including Syria and Iraq, what has happened. That was not an easy fight, and that ended up with almost in two years with three elections, and thankfully we ended up June 24th elections, we jumped to a, switched to a new system, dropping the number of ministries in 2002 from 36 to 26, and within that sense, in 2018, after the election, 26 to 16, a very much result-oriented, a very strong, committed management system. This is why, having said that, comparing to 10 years ago, the global crisis, 2008 global crisis has affected all around the world, right? After 10 years later, we have witnessed a similar crisis, which has a much worse effect because this one has a specific effect on Turkey, including currency, inflation, and interest rates, right? For three months. But thankfully, within the help of this new executional power that we have on the hand, with the news, we thankfully wiped out this all the effects in three months. Thankfully, not only currency appreciation is in the, on, the, on the way as well, but also current account balancing is on the way as well. And also uh, the inflation is getting much more stronger. November and December is going well in that sense as well. But all in all, again, what I said about if it doesn't kill you, makes it stronger. What we have named so far in the September, the new economical program, we said that we know the vulnerabilities, we know the strengths and weaknesses, but we know what we have to do for that transformation. This is why we named rebalancing discipline and within the help of these two, we are going to transform the economy within a base of a real economy, which Turkey already has. This is why we have created this economical export miracle in 16 years, almost six times comparing to 2001 or two. It used to be around $30 billion to reach $170 billion of export. So this is why three consecutive months we have witnessed current account surpluses, August, September, and October. And thankfully, in November, it's going to be a strong one. And the initial 10, year, 10 days results of the December in that sense as well. So that's a challenging but a very much uh, strong experience for Turkey and hoping that it's going to be much brighter for that sense as well. Can I just ask a, uh, a couple of very quick follow-up questions? As, as you said, the current account deficit problem, which was in some ways the cause of the concerns about the Turkish economy, has been turned around. But it's been turned around essentially by a massive squeeze on domestic demand and spending. And in the last three months, growth was negative, it's still positive on a year-on-year -year basis. Do you see uh, Turkey being able to avoid a recession in the months ahead? Most external forecasts don't agree with your government's forecast of a 2.3% growth next year. They see a, a modest decline in output. You, 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 you ask a very strong question and very right question, Chris. Everybody is asking on that. Why this one is different, we see in the numbers as well. There is this old, ti old time this saying about, you know, urban legend stories about if an economy slows down, just like Turkey used to have in 2008 or 11, whatever, the crisis as well, the whole trade package slows down. Not only export, import, the whole package. But what we have witnessed so far within this recent one, we see a significant slowing down on import, which I do all the time said that. There is this foam over there. There is this luxury current account expenditures about this import part of it, which we do Turkey as producing whatever you name for internally in the local internal, internal production capability of Turkish industrial capacity was strong. But what we need to do, not only appreciation of the currency, but moreover then the 
policies that we execute on the front within the help of the infra, infra, uh, instra, uh, infrastructural base, but structural reforms help on that sense, we can expand our, grow our export as well. This is why last four months, we created more than 20% of decrease in import, but almost 10% increase on export. This is why we shrink this current account deficit and create it whatsoever. And about recession, again, it's very much important. Even though what we have witnessed in 2008 crisis, just like the other global economies, we have witnessed four quarter shrinking, negative growth in that experience. But whatever the talks and estimates about the third quarter of Turkish economy, we have created 1.6% positive growth, which is very much crucial. Even if you think that the previous year, 2017 third quarter results was record high comparing to the Q third quarter 2016, it was 11.1%. Even the base effect was a strong negative message on the ground. Thankfully, we have witnessed a positive third quarter. So the thing is, we have balanced this rebalancing strategy within the shrinking of the whole trade from the import side, but we have filled this gap with export increase plus tourism revenues and huge, by the way, its performance is 20% every year growing. Not only witnessing, I think this will be record high year, almost 42 million tourists Turkey will attract it, will be a biggest one ever. And the revenue size, almost $30 billion, and it's growing every single year around 20% that I have mentioned. So the idea of rebalancing coming from the reality and the basics of a real producing economy in that sense. So uh, what I have named so far about the uh, question that you have mentioned is the normalization will be realistically on the ground in case of rather than 7, 8, 9% growth, switching to a 3%, 2%, 4% growth, but a very much quality, no current account deficit, a balancing within a sense of a base that you can create in that sense as well. Okay, let's move on to talk about the wider emerging markets and the, the immediate future. Mr. Mardi, do you see 2018, which has been, I think in everyone's book, quite a difficult, challenging year in emerging markets, is that a, is that a one-off where there are particular aspects, particularly the strength of the US dollar and the, and the movement of funds back to the US that have caused difficulties this year? Or is this the new normal we're moving into? Well, I think uh, if you look at this, the success of, of, of the emerging market on the last decades was mainly to, you know, trade liberalizations, corporate governance, and, and connectivities. And I think what, what we've seen, in, especially in the second half of 2018, is, is, you know, more tension on the trade issues that's really putting big concerns on emerging market uh, growth. We've seen a bit stronger dollars, which also putting the pressure of the outflow of some of the uh, current, some of the, uh, or impacting some of the currencies in, in the emerging market. Giving the uncertainty that we're also seeing in Europe toward the Brexit, this is by itself also giving that a negative sentiment in the global markets. Uh, so I think, yes, 2018 was a difficult, but I still, still think that also. Early 2019, if these issues were not addressed, I still think they will also consider to be a, some sort of a risk going forward for the emerging market. And Mr. Seving, is 2019 the year that we should be looking forward to, or should we be nervous that the global economy now does seem to be slowing down? I think we, we, we have to admit that 2019 will be, from a growth point of view, slower and slightly weaker than 2018. But, but let's be honest, I mean, 2018 growth rates all over the world have been very, very solid. I mean, we have enjoyed, and now not going into each and every country, but globally we have enjoyed eight years of an upward trend. And we're now we are all surprised that we see kind of the end of a normal cycle. Um, and I would also agree, I think we are overemphasizing potentially the dependency now on emerging markets. I think the, the real issue this world is facing is that we are hit by four to five risks around the world, partially economic risks, partially geopolitical risks. And the kind of, that those five risks are 
kind of hitting us at the same time, that makes 2019 more vulnerable than 2018. We have the trade war. And honestly, look at some of um, our German companies, automotive suppliers, who are already noticing that, that there is um, this trade discussion, not only between the US and Europe, but between US and China, with an impact on, on the suppliers in Germany. We have a Brexit discussion, which is nothing more than uncertainty. And uh, we just heard a wonderful keynote speech at the beginning that politicians are there in order to turn uncertainty into certainty. We are just, we are just experiencing, experiencing the opposite in Europe, actually. We have a public debt outstanding in the world, not only by, economy, by emerging markets, but globally, which is rising. And we certainly have also in Europe, when you look at uh, some of the European countries, um, like Italy, we have a debt issue which needs to be tackled and where we need to find solutions. So if you think about these four or five risks which are looming around, and then I always go back and say, what is actually the biggest risk there? And therefore, I'm happy about this conference and that so much emphasis was put this morning on communication, of joint policies, of talking to each other, finding the right solutions. The real issue is, if you compare this year with 2008, when we had the last biggest, uh, the last uh, uh, financial crisis, 2008 was only contained for one reason. Governments across the world, regulators across the world, central banks across the world work together. My biggest fear is with the four or five risks we just talked about is, where is this international coordination? Would we have in such a scenario a cooperation which we need? And if you think about this, then certainly 2019 will have, in my view, lower growth rates and a little bit more of uncertainty than what we have seen 2018. Those are, those are very important points, and they do highlight some of the wider uh, tensions and stresses in the global economy. And you can see it already in the data, just look at US exports of cars to China down 40% since tariffs the retaliatory tariffs went in. We have had a, a blockade for a couple of years here, uh, here in Qatar, and we, there is a there is a, a pulling apart of global cooperation. Mr. Albarat, uh, in the in your crisis in the summer, uh, you received some support from Qatar. You didn't go to the. Uh, the normal channels of the global institutions to help countries who are suffering liquidity crises. Can you explain why not, and whether this is an example of that you maybe don't don't trust them, that they aren't there for you? And what what would what what do you need to to help be a force of stability in the global economy? Chris, I think this is one of the hottest questions that I used to take all the time from the all you know, international programs that I've attended. Turkey as a regular emerging market about this IMF issue, which I'm going to name it very specifically. I have a saying that before I dive to the sea, I need to you know, see the indebtedness of that sea. So, so you need to see what you have or not. Uh, after I have been appointed in July, my first ta task was I need to define the see the real deal, the balance sheet, what we have on hand. Not only negotiate, not only manage, whatever. When I look at the balance sheet of Turkey, because that's very much crucial, you need to see what you have on the hand. Let me define that and you answer yourself about the answer of this question. Four bases of a balance sheet is crucial. Public, household, financial and non-financial. So these four bases creates a balance sheet of a global part of a country's balance sheet, right? When we, look at, when we look at that, the Turkey's public portion of this, public debt to GDP portion of this, that strategy is around 28%, which is one of the lowest comparing to the emerging markets, which is like 49%, and the global average is 60, 70, 80, much higher than that. Turkey has no problem on the public portion of it. What about the second one, household? Turkish household, Again, I have mentioned Turkish people, Turkish institutions, companies, friend companies learned a lot during the crisis that we have witnessed so far. This is why we ended up 16% to GDP household lending, which is not only very low, by the way, comparing to the emerging markets, 36% average, or it's around 60% to the global average. Not only, not only it's very low, but what is crucial over here, 
2001 crisis learned the whole people on the street that all, almost all of this lending is local currency, no foreign currency lending. So there is no currency risk on that. But well, your, co your companies have a, lot, uh, have a lot of foreign currency. I'm coming to three, four. I'm in number two. Be patient. <laughs> so even though the, that's very much important, everybody was talking about comparing to one year ago, the currency uh, depreciation almost 90%, 100%. Why you can't see any single person on the street? This is why, because of that, because people have no, you know, currency, foreign currency lending. Three, banks, financials, or we say it. The financials portion is around 26 percent. The EM average is around 33, 35 percent. The global average is much, much higher. But two things is crucial in the private part of the picture, companies part of the picture. The financial institutions, banking institutions, have a significant capital adequacy ratio. But moreover than that, the thing is, it's around 18%, 16%, almost double the legal limit, 8%, comparing to the European, all the other emerging market cushions we are talking about. But even though within that sense, what we have named so far in September, I have announced myself that we are closely following up the financial sector. I think the uh, detailed studies will be announced by the end of this year from the BRSA, the Regal Authority of Turkey, uh, showing the real detailed studies, stress tests, whatever the financial sector already on the ground. So the thing is, we see very much comfortability on that sense as well. But plus, what you have mentioned, private sector, private companies, which is around 68%. The EM average is at 95%. Even it's lower than the EM average, there are two things that was very much crucial. First one is, we created, a, uh, we announced a new legislation organizing and uh, uh, coordinating the private sector's lending has to be naturally hashed within the same currency lending should be financed with the same companies, should has to create the same currency revenue as well. If you want to borrow dollar currency, you have to have some dollar revenue as well. So this has created a short term for the next 12 months, or midterm, a positive currency exposure, 4.5, almost $5 billion for the private sector as well. But moreover than that, what is very much crucial, Chris? That's a very uh, substantial information, which I used to work in the private sector in 2005, 6, 10, 11, 13, whatever, from the other side of the table, which I used to know very well that. The private party lending is very much interesting, which is something attached with customs union experience of Turkey, starting from mid-90s, which means that to those companies who used to export Europe, whatever, outside of Turkey, most of those private companies accumulated most of their revenues or profits outside of Turkey to create this kind of wealth on different portfolios as well. And this may end up almost significant amount of this net lending, which is around 80, $86 billion. By the way, out of this $86 billion of private lending, net foreign lending, 55% of them is 15 biggest companies, and the rest, 45%, around $40 billion, belongs to 2,000 private companies, which has related, attached with, back-to-back, -back their own money. Which means that this significant amount of lending covers their own risk within their backed currency, same currency reserves that they have. But even though, out of these four these things that we have mentioned, we see the whole risk on the basket. All in all, if we accumulated the whole these four portions to the Turkish balance sheet, which makes 138% to GDP of Turkey, which is around 211%, on EM average and around 318% the global average. Within that sense, Turkey is in a very strong and comfortable cushion in that sense about, the, about this balance sheet. So what I need to have as a government and a third party to support within this. Well, you, you certainly hear, heard it here first that Tur Turkish debt, even though people around the world think it's a problem, the finance minister is assuring us that things are fine. I wanted to move on to maybe a really big and deep question, I think, for all the panel. Um, 
we've seen a breakdown in sort of economic relations and even in, in June there was the most extraordinary G7 where the leaders of the seven biggest or not biggest but most important economies in some ways in the world couldn't even agree that a rules-based system of international trade was something that they could all sign up to. Uh, perhaps when we're talking about emerging economies, the real fear in America is that they don't like the idea that they're no longer the most important economy in the world or no longer necessarily going to be the biggest economy in the world and on some measures they already haven't been since 2014. I wanted to ask all the panel whether the global system can actually handle, can cope with uh, a change in the global pecking order from it being just obvious that America was the most important place in the world to one where there's not necessarily that that's changed, but there's more tension and there's more challenge there. Maybe Mr. Mbadi, you could go first. I, I think it's, we like it or not, you know, the global economy is, is changing and it's, it has changed in the last, at least in the last two decades, especially with where the emerging market is going. And, and, if, and I, I said this in, on uh, my earlier remark that, you know, in the next five years, almost 60% of, of the global GDP will be from the emerging market. So, and even if you look at from the population point of view, you know, most of the developed countries, they are, they are almost in, the, in their population, they, they peaked, or, or some of them are seeing even a decline. But if you look at the population growth in the emerging market, the expected, just the expected growth in the next, t until 2030, you will have one more billion people in those countries. And if you look at the GDP per capita on, on, on the emerging market, you know, and what's expected by the IMF for the next just five years. They're, they're expecting a 30% growth in GDP per capita for emerging market. This is uh, double the, the growth on, on any development uh, country. So what, what I can see that I think the emerging market is, is coming very strongly. US will remain an important country and it will remain an economic dominant country globally you know, because of, of, of many reasons. But I think this will not be as significant as it today. So it's, I think, for all, I think we're going to see more activities from the emerging market, and they will have bigger uh, share of the global markets. Oh, where in the world excites you uh, most in terms of emerging markets? What, what part, what regions? Well, you know, Far East has always been, you know, if we, if we talk about Far East, it's always been very dynamic, very progressive. Uh, you know, India and China has always been on the forefront of, of the global growth. I think this is, I mean, we, we, we like what we see in Indonesia and Malaysia in terms of progressing and really developing their economy. As I always said, that they, they, need, to, they need to take, you know, what they've done in the last, you know, they need to continue of their, their, their progressive economical agenda, you know, especially Ad, you know, ad, especially adapting uh, the best practice in, in terms of corporate governors. Just before we open it up to questions to the audience, Mr. Albarat, where, where do you see the, do you see that the international cooperation can actually improve in the years ahead, or is, is this a, just a, a tension that is going to get more and more difficult? Uh, that's an important question, Chris. What Christopher a little bit ago mentioned about this, the uh, approaching of the global economies about this crisis is, you know, threatening the potential things that we may face. Because, at least from my side, I could tell that a couple of weeks ago we were at the G20, and maybe it's the first time ever in the last minute the communique has not been approved for the whole parties, and very, very last minute we have approved because of the increasing tension of the trade war issues, and it's something that we all concerned. Not we all say, but just recently, uh, I think Professor Allison has mentioned at FT that we are literally a uh, uh, cold war on this issue between US and China, what he have mentioned. But what I have read about this problem, the concerning problem, recently on Atlantic Council report recently, regarding to the previous 
experiences that the world has witnessed so far for centuries old. Out of the 16 economical crises that the world has witnessed so far, 12 of them ended up with war whatsoever. So this is not a good sign. This is not a good thing. And comparing to 2008, for sure, there are some this unilateralism concerns, you know, protectionism concerns, rather than a win-win strategy, everyone is getting more and more insight whatsoever. And for sure, Mr. Minister mentioning about the emerging market philosophy has changed, and this is for sure a different century comparing to the previous one. And what is very much crucial as well? Mr. Seven. We are talking about growth, right? What growth means? It comes from two Ps, right? Population and production. And where this population is coming from, still we are looking at the emerging market. Where this production is coming from, still within that sense. And by 2030, most of the experts are saying that just the consolidated GDP of India and China, just these two, will be more than G7, and the population will be reaching more than 3 billion. So the thing is the Asia-centered global economy and all this shift has creating not only opportunities but also threats as well. And that's the question. What we need to do, find that in term role to find a uh, significant s solution for the sake of the whole world, not the countries as well. Mr. Seving. Well, I said everything about the necessity of international cooperation. Um, that is a threat to the world, which we, which we need to solve. I think it's a little bit too um, kind of uh, short thought uh, just to, to think about where is the power shifting. I think it's all about the adjustment of the economies. You know, if, if, if I just think about from the region I'm coming out of my home country, that was 20 or 30 years ago, a region where 90% of the economy was with furniture production, textile production, and printing industry. Everybody thought this region will go down. It's still one of the most prospering region in Germany because they amended themselves. They reorganized themselves. And therefore, it's not only emerging markets versus developed markets. It's the way you react to global trends. And that is, for instance, something where Europe needs now to react. If you think about platform economies, that is in the US, very strong, and in Asia. Europe kind of lost the first half of the game. And there we need to step up, there we need to think. So it's not only emerging markets versus developing markets, it's about where the industry trends go and how much you invest in there. And I agree, the young people are somewhere else than in the developed markets. We need to attract those young people in order to be competitive in the long term. And I think that's the game what we have to play. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to open it up to very brief questions. If you could put your hand up, I can find it. There's a gentleman just in the middle there with, with a tie on. Yep. There's a microphone coming to you now. Yes, just just just. There, number three. Yep. Thank you. And if you could ask a brief question, keep it short and, and direct to the panel. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've heard uh, more traditional analysis of uh, the drivers for you know, power or production. We're talking about number of people and, and production. What about technology? with robotics and so on. Uh, what is your forecast uh, of the power you know, and economy size in the future, taking into account technological advancement? Thank you. OK, Mr. Mardi, would you like to take that? Well, I, I, I agree. You know, technology will, will, play, will play a big part in, in, in any economies today. But I think if, if you look at the emerging market, what, what I think the ministers of Turkey mentioned that in terms of population is, is the demand issues uh, and how these, we can really fuel these demands in, in these type of economies. I still think there is a lot more to go in the emerging markets in terms of you know, not having that much an impact of technology as we see that the disruptive technology as we see it in more of the development, uh, development uh, countries. But yes, this is one of the areas that it is coming. And, and I think a lot of countries that are really adjusting very well. They're changing their way of, of, of doing business, uh, especially you know, if you look at the financial sector, the auto sectors, and how this will impact the unemployment in some of these countries. 
But yes, this is, this is one of the risks that I'm sure a lot of countries are looking at it. Thank you. I, have, I think we have time just for one more question. Here towards the front, number two, please. Please, I want to draw attention to a very <coughs> important obstacle for the emerging countries. This, which I mean, selling arms by the advancing countries to our poor countries. This satanic swab between making prosperity in your countries and job and ruining and destroying our countries. Please stop selling arms and send to us machines, manures, technology. Then the terrorism will finish, be finished, and illegal immigration. This is more important. We have to take all means to stop this satanic swap. I think there was a really a question for someone from an, an, an advanced call. Mr. Seving, would you like to comment very quickly on selling arms to emerging markets and whether uh, that is something that is the world should be seeking to end? Well, I think, uh, to be honest, uh, first of all, if um, and you won't be uh, completely happy with my answer because obviously I'm answering this one out of the view of the financial institutions. I think we have the tightest and the most robust guidelines and policies around this to only do this to countries where we think that they have the right intention and that is for only for defense reasons and that is not for any aggressive nature. And I think if everybody would behave like that, um, uh, I think we would be in a, in a better shape. Um, so that is Deutsche Bank's policy and we stick to that one to one. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the panel, uh, Mr. El Mardi, Mr. Al Barat, and Mr. Seving, for what I think was a, an extremely informative session, which I think in most ways we understand there's problems out there which the world does need to deal with and policy needs to adapt to, to take account of the new challenges. But you can't get over the fact that the emerging world is where the growth of the future is coming from and we should take away a reasonably positive message. Can we thank the panel, please?